Hey everyone, Unbox is a bi-monthly event series where guests are asked questions in an AMA style format, focusing on questions relevant to early stage startups and blockchain technology. Unblocked is sponsored by DLab, a startup accelerator and venture studio that sits within the SOSV family. You can find out more at www.dlab.bc. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Welcome everybody to um, uh, the newest episode of Unblocked. My guest today is Clayton Roche. She's the head of community development at UMA, which is a fast, flexible, and secure way to create synthetic assets on Ethereum. Clayton, welcome. Hey, Paul. Thanks for having me on. It's great to be here. Yeah, super excited to jump into uh, you, you, the KPI um, initiative you guys have going. But before we jump into it, I think it'd be great um, just to give the audience a little summary or explanation of what UMA is. Is it UMA Protocol, UMA Project, or UMA? Uh, UMA Protocol, we'll go with that. We, okay, we do kind cool. of uh, use them a little bit interchangeably. But yeah, um, yeah we'll call it UMA Protocol. Um, yeah, so I'd love to give you some background on what it is. Um, it's a conversation that we have surprisingly often, despite being as late as we are and having been on mainnet for about a year. We have a regular conversation about what UMA is um, because the actual applicability of what we've built is quite broad. In fact, it's sort of like, I sort of refer to it as suffocatingly broad because you can tell people, well, it's the Oracle for anything or synthetic assets for anything. And uh, that's great, but it's really hard to wrap your head around what that means and what you can do with it. So um, what UMA is at its sort of corest level is a truth machine where you can basically ask questions of the protocol and trust the answer. And this is done through economic guarantees rather than sort of like any sort of decentralized node system. It's literally just set up such a way that if you ever wanted to pay the people to lie for your, on your behalf to, to sort of uh, mess with this truth system, you'd have to pay more money to break it than you could possibly make by doing so. And that's the nature of an economic guarantee. So that's like a super 30,000 foot look at sort of what UMA is. Um, the thing that we have chose to focus on with this tool is, is contracts and particularly financial contracts. And so if you think about a contract out in a normal legal system, you have, uh, you know, you have two parties agree to something, and then if one party were to violate the contract, you have a court system that you can go to to adjudicate that, that uh, to to rule on it, right? And the court system would look at the evidence and decide who was was the was the um, winning party. So we've done a sort of similar thing where you can use UMA to adjudicate disputes, and and also just use it to write those contracts, and so you can create payout functions. And you can say, I will pay you X number of dollars or X number of collateral or whatever it is based on a, a world circumstance. And that circumstance could be the price of an asset on another crypto exchange, or that circumstance could be whether the SpaceX rocket delivered its payload successfully, or there's actually the sky is the limit on sort of the circumstances. Um, you do need them to be you know, fairly like uh, codifiable and, and straightforward. Um, you know, if it gets really subjective, that might get a little bit messy. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're really focusing on the financial contracts. Um, yeah, so yeah, that, that's, that, that's, overview. No, that's, that's an interesting description of UMA because, you know, when I was first reading about it and, um, you know, a couple of years ago when I first heard about it, um, uh, you know, it was just like, oh, you can create a synthetic asset and, you know, it allows people universal market access. So someone, in the US, we take for granted that we can just go to Vanguard and buy the S&P 500, but someone sitting in uh, you know, Nairobi, Nigeria can't have that access, but maybe through UMA they can. But mm -hmm. the implication is that it's, well, I mean, what I first jumped to, and maybe that's just me, but I'm just like, oh, it's like another synthetics. But I guess, so I guess where I'm leading is how is it different from what synthetics is trying to do? Sure. So it's, there, there certainly could be some overlap, um, but there's like so much design space here that we are not really haven't even really run into each other yet. Mm -hmm. um, what synthetics is able to do is is quite a bit different be, because um, they are collateralized with the N SNX token, and so that gives them these certain superpowers, such as infinite uh, infinite liquidity without slippage, which is interesting because you're essentially minting against your SNX rather than um, actually borrowing on an active market. Um, 
the difference with regard to synthetics, uh, sorry, with regard to synthetics with a CS and not an X, just is that with UMA, you can collateralize with any particular token as long as it sort of has uh, sufficient security um, criteria. And so you can use UMA kind of simply as a borrowing mechanism. And so we've seen that happen with yield dollar products where what that is is people um, will come in with their project token and they'll enable that as a collateral. And then you can mint dollar tokens against that collateral. So it's just synthetic dollars. Oh, and interesting. effectively makes it into a lending and borrowing product, which synthetics with an X could not do because uh, they only allow SNX as the collateral right. type. Right. So you you have to you could create a contract, but on synthetics you have to put up whatever the ratio is of synthetic tokens to back that contract. And that that's my understanding. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then and so either way you yep. Yeah. So I guess with but with UMA, let's say a new let's say a new project, right? Uh, you know X Y Z token just launched. Uh, they have a lot of tokens in their treasury. Could they come to UMA and issue, as you had mentioned, a more like a, a, a basically a stable coin, so to speak, that they could in turn get liquidity on their token when it's like locked up in the treasury, for example? Um, is that a, a, a potential use case? Yes and no. And so, yes, it absolutely is. But I will point out that in order for something to be a good collateral, it needs to have sufficient liquidity on the market such that sort of imagine a, com a project comes along and has 90% of their tokens in their own treasury and they create this token and there's like, maybe there's only a million dollars of liquidity out there in the pools. Um, they could like deposit all of their tokens and mint against them when, and then basically you could sort of use it to rug pull uh, this way if you did it that way. So like it does require analyzing the, um, it, you sort of need a healthy token in order to use it in that fashion. However, okay. there is a product design we're working on, which is a range bond, which will allow projects to basically let, borrow, essentially borrow money from people in exchange for their token. And this would be done in such a way that um, that wouldn't have this risk associated with it. So we are actually working on a new product that would work a little bit similarly to what you're proposing without having to worry about those uh, security considerations. I see. And so the, the bond will allow people to to get loans, I guess. Sorry, I didn't I didn't quite follow that. It, it would allow the foundation to borrow money from people and oh. the payouts would be associated with uh, with being paid out in that utility token or the project token, the governance token, most likely. Okay, interesting. And so uh, you have this, as you described, truth machine, and there's sort of an arbiter of truth. And it sounds like there's somewhat, you know, there's some form of a court, whatever you want to call it, a digital court, whatever. How is it different from what, let's say, Claros has uh -huh. uh, developed? Sure. Sure. It's got some similarities. Um, I would say that um, I'm actually not like, like I definitely know that Claros is up there in this category of things, right? I think probably the biggest difference is we've really focused on the financial contracts side of things. And so, you know, Claros, as my understanding, you can sort of use it as an, as an arbiter in certain situations. What's nice with UMA is we've actually built out the financial contract. So you're not ever actually using UMA's uh, or sorry, let me back up. Those contracts allow you to specify exactly what the payout function is and what the collateral is going to be. And essentially, you can design a financial, um, I don't know, just a contract or programmable money, essentially, and have these deterministic outcomes. And I don't think that Claros like, offers those financial contracts portion of this. Mm -hmm. And then I would also say that what's cool about UMA and something that we are we sort of debuted somewhat recently but quietly is our optimistic oracle which works whereby when it comes time to resolve one of these markets. So let's, for example, say we're talking about the SpaceX launch, and this is something that just was released this week. The way the optimistic Oracle works is you don't actually need to ask everyone to, to vote on the outcome. All you do is you ask anyone can submit a reply and say this, the mission was successful or unsuccessful. And then it takes someone else to dispute it and only if there's a dispute would it actually need to go on chain, uh, or sorry, go to a go to a token holder vote. And so this allows it to be extremely um, cost effective. And essentially, the the incentives are set up that you would never dispute it if you weren't really like, fairly confident because you have to post a bond to dispute it. Um, and so essentially, we expect it to be used quite infrequently. It's just the threat, you know, it's 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 the threat of the uh, voting system that would stop people from ever needing to use it. Um, and just behave in a way that's uh, optimistically, uh, yeah. It's just like optimistic rollups. And so you differ from, say, like a chain link solution in the sense that you don't require people to spin up their own node, and 
you know, plug in the outside APIs or anything like that, the, the arbiter or the Oracle, so to speak, is the community, is that? Yeah, that's correct. Um, and so it's, it's specifically the community of token holders. So they have, a, they have a real vested interest in the value of the UMA token that they're voting with. And so um, the, the economic guarantees here are basically like <clears throat> the people who are voting have more to lose by ruining UMA than they would by potentially being bribed by whoever's, um, you know, whoever has to gain from a particular outcome. Um, so yes, that's, that's one big difference. And then the other difference I'd mentioned with something like Chainlink is that Chainlink is very, very good at, at maintaining like a fidelity with the API output. So the API says, hey, the value of DAI is this. Chainlink can grab that data and push it across all the nodes and across the products that are using Chainlink. What's cool about UMA is if something happens at the API level and the API says, hey, the value of DAI is $1.30. Um, and that, you know, yeah, that might get chain, that might get picked up and proliferated. But what's cool with UMA is someone can dispute that. And UMA token holders can go back and actually look at the data that came from the API and say, like, is this actually the truthful value? And so we're actually able to, at, at moments of like extreme dispute and extreme upset, right? We can actually look at the source and, and understand whether that was the correct data or whether there was some sort of error or manipulation. Um, hmm. So we can kind of go a little bit deeper in that security direction. I see. So, so just using a quick practical example, if I bought a UMA contract that the S&P 500 would be at 103 months and the S&P 500 is at 105 and I get to execute at 100. Um, does, the, does the contract just automatically execute itself or is there, there needs to be a vote by the community that yes, the S&P 500 was at 100 or does it just automatically execute there? And then I can dispute when, if, if it was at 105 and then it never executed, then I could dispute it and, it, and then it goes to a vote. Um. Like in one, like it could work that way. What usually yeah. ends up happening is the people buying those contracts don't really have to worry about like going in and checking and then proposing and, and disputing. There's financial incentives that make it so anyone could be the person doing that. And so you're not the only one that can do that. And, and it's actually nice. You don't have to worry about doing it. It's essentially just that anyone sort of after the expiry, there's going to be, there's going to be a request and it's going to say, hey, what's the value of the S&P 500? somebody's going to input that information. And then there's what we call a liveness period where um, somebody could dispute it. And so the market is not settled until the end of that period. So let's just say it's two hours. That's kind of our default time. So there's a two hour window where anyone could come in and say, hey, it's not $400, it's $105 or $100. Um, and as long as nobody does that, it will expire uh, at those after two hours, or sorry, it will settle at two hours with the price that was proposed, as long as no one disputes it. And then for the most part, we see people setting up bots to do this uh, this activity um, so it's, because it's yeah it's similar to how people unwind CDPs or watch that whole market, I guess, where people come in and you know um, you know unwind the, the positions. You mean so? There's there's the case where CDPs become under the collateral requirement right. and go to auction. Right. Is that what you mean? Yeah, that, well, that whole sub market, I guess, because if I take out a CDP, I'm not watching it, but I could wake up tomorrow and a bunch of shit sure. happened, right? So is it kind of right. like, I mean, I guess, a, a, you know, there's a bunch of stuff going under, going on underneath the hood, but is that yeah. similar to how Huma would work, where there's economic incentives for other participants to come in and take care of these things that I don't have to worry yes. about? Okay, got it. Yeah, I'm just gonna say yeah without going into too right. no, much no, that's fair. Granularity. That that's it's it's fair. Keepers, and so, system. Yep. how how has um participation been so far amongst voters? Um, yeah. Sure. So we have around like a 35% token participation, meaning that around 35% of the tokens circulating um, participate. Um, this is uh, like something I should mention is that voting participation is actually incentivized. And um, you, uh, every time there's a vote, there's a 0.05%, uh, so 1 20th of a percent supply inflation that's distributed to participating voters. So you can see how that would sort of effectively dilute non-participating voters. So it's very much meant to be a, um, an activity rewarding sort of system as opposed to um, just being able to buy and hold without participating. Um, yeah. Cool. So I guess as a, as a lead through to that, to keep the 
before we go into KP, the, the KPI initiative, but just curious, do you use the KPI initiative to incentivize people to vote, participate, or even in the keeper system? Just curious. Before we delve um, no, into... That's... Sure. No, that's an yeah. awesome question. Um, we haven't used it specifically for that. What we've done, we have done incentives though. So not only is there the voting um, participation, uh, actual incentive built into the protocol, there's also a program we run called the Liquid Liquidation Opportunity Program, where we, in, we basically go out there and we intentionally under collateralize a position. So we put a position that's, uh, that's under the um, requirement. Um, basically, we're leaving some free money on chain for a bot to find. And so we've done that to incentivize the keeper, to incentivize a network of people that are running these bots. Um, uh, we haven't actually used the KPI option specifically for that. We could, but we're mm -hmm. our, we're primarily focused on uh, you know external integrations and trying to get other parties to use the KPI options. Got it. Okay, so let's just jump right into. So for listeners, and I understand that not everybody knows what KPIs, OKRs are. We use them uh, religiously here at SOSV, and we ask our companies to use them. But uh, in your own words, what are what are KPIs? Sure. So a key performance indicator is at least in the context of the way we use it, it's basically like, it's something that may not actually be an indication of success, but it's sufficiently good proxy for an indication of success that you can use it as a measure of like how successful you're being. Um, and yeah, that's basically the way I would put it. It's something so, that's sometimes yeah. easier to measure than it is. Yeah, just that, yeah. something you can measure. It's important. Yes, part of it. <laughs> yeah. Very key. Something you can measure. Yeah. That's what we always yeah. tell our, our startups because sometimes it's something and we're like, how do you know if you're 50% of the way there or 75% of the way there? And yep. um, what, what, what do you hear at SOSV? We consider 75% a success. Do you consider that mm -hmm. the same or do you use a higher metric or lower? So what's cool about this. So I, I remember I explained to you this idea that you can write a contract mm -hmm. uh, with UMA, right? If you're, if you are using, if SOSV is using a KPI option program or initiative, you're just going to write the contract and define it exactly as success means to you. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, you could. Got it. However, you write that contract out is going to depend. It's going to affect that. And and what was sort of the genesis for this initiative? Like, does has Zuma been using KPIs since its inception? Um, is this something new? I was just curious about where the idea came from. Sure. It sort of, it came from Hart, who's one of the co-founders, but working closely with a lot of his like uh, economist friends and whatnot. And um, I think actually some people at GSR had also talked about a similar idea. It was, it was sort of just like, you know, people, finance yeah, people chatting with each other came up with the idea. We sort of recognized that it would be good to build on UMA. Um, and we talked a lot about what the name should even be. You know, we settled on KPI, which I didn't love at first. I wanted to call them mechanism options, but that's probably even less accessible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, people in, you know, we have this, te op you know, in crypto, we have this um, ten trend of like just renaming things that already exist, which kind of ends up confusing people like Maker, for sure. example, not, not centering on Maker, but they invented all these terms that, you know, right. They renamed yeah. all these terms that exist already and it just confuses sure. people. But anyway, um, have you ever used KPIs before, or was this your first interaction at UMA uh, with KPIs? Um, so I don't come, like just me personally, I don't come from like a corporate background, so I haven't used them to sort of officially. I mean, now, of course, I've been part of sprint sprint uh, uh, pl planning and whatnot, where we set yeah. goals, right? Yeah. But um, I've never had like a bonus structure based on a KPI kind of set up just yeah. personally. And, yeah. and so like, I guess for you, what do you like about them? Um, like, how do you think mm -hmm. they're great at driving, I guess, organizational efficiency or keeping people engaged? Um, sure. It would be great to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you think, actually, do you think maybe maybe I should explain maybe how they work a little bit yeah. first before no, I answer please. that? We can, we, yeah, we can jump. Yeah, go ahead. Um, um, so okay, you, cool. announced, you announced the KPI options uh, this year, right? Earlier this year in February or yep. January of this year. Um, and it's essentially tradable KPIs. So what does that mean exactly? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, because I think what I like about them would, would sort of fall out of that. Um, so essentially, you when you're going to do a KPI option launch with UMA, you need to obviously determine what that KPI is going to be, how you're going to measure it, and what success looks like for you. 
then you're going to determine how much you want to pay out to people. So you would, you know, you would lock up, you would actually lock up the maximum amount that you would pay out. So if you were going to pay your staff a bonus for getting um, COVID vaccinations, for example, you might choose like 100K as the max payout. And then you would say what level of um, staff vaccinations you want to see happen uh, and, and what, that, what that corresponds to in terms of the payout. Then for the, for the program, you want to you wanna give these options out to people that can help affect the outcome. And so with my COVID vaccination thing, you might probably give them to the people you want to have be vaccinated, right? Um, but you could give them to their managers or you could give them to their family members, you know, who knows? You, you, you sort of want to think about who can help you achieve your goal. And I think there's actually some clever opportunities here, even with that part of the design. Um, and then basically what happens is, so let's say you chose a three-month window and we're doing the COVID vaccination example. You choose a three-month window, you give them out today, you say, hey, depending on how, how many people get vaccinations, these are going to be worth anywhere from, um, let's say, zero to $100 each. And you gave, you know, you, uh, I guess maybe, you, I don't, I'm not going to try to do the math in my head, but you gave out a bunch, right? And so maybe everyone gets 10 pieces, right? 10 tokens. And so um, they have an incentive over that three-month period to affect the outcome. Now, there's a couple of interesting things that happen here. One is that they're tradable, um, which could be good or bad. And, and you can kind of encourage it or discourage it. With, with UMO, when we did our airdrop with these, we actually saw people create a liquidity pool and fund it in order to try to buy up some of the options from people who were, um, who were like less bullish on their outcome or maybe didn't take the time to understand them. They just wanted to dump them like some people do with an airdrop. Um, uh, so whether, you know, whether it's useful that they're tradable is, de is depends on kind of the program you're running. The other neat thing that this creates, and I think that this is probably one of the cooler parts of it, is um, essentially you've created this financial goal that's shared among the people who receive the airdrop. And so they receive kind of an interesting type of coordination incentive where not only does doing good things in the community they're a part of like benefit them directly, it also benefits the people they're working alongside of, and it gives them a very like near-term goal. Um, this phenomenon of, of sort of having a bag and, and working to promote it and, and being encouraged by the community, that's a normal thing in crypto. But what's cool about the KPI options is it creates this like sort of much more viscerally immediate payout that you can sort of set a few months from now. And instead of just saying, hey, let's hustle to increase the value of UMA tokens, we're saying, hey, let's hustle so all of the other people holding these options will receive more UMA tokens. And at the same time, increase the value of those UMA tokens because we're growing the protocol. So I'm, I'm leading into what I like about it. Sorry for my monologue. But no, what I like good. about it is, is I think, and, and so far my personal experience with it has been, it creates a type of human coordination that I think we haven't really experimented with that much. Um, and is adding like it's sort of just adding this extra multiplier layer on the community impact of crypto, and we've seen amazing communities come out of crypto, and it, it has to do with own, be owning some of the protocol you're helping to build, right? This just adds an extra layer on it, helps focus that community, that group that's working on it. Um, the other cool thing about KPI options is you can get pretty clever with them. You could give them to people unwittingly, so. We had this idea to um, to give a KPI option to the Economist Foundation, which is a, a like an education charity, and we would say, "Hey, if the Economist magazine puts Uma's name in print uh, by the end of this year, we will pay out a hundred thousand dollars to your charity." Right, and wow. so you can sort of put this proposition in somebody's lap without even their their permission, so to speak. Right, um, and it's just interesting things you could do. You could airdrop these tokens. We haven't done like a, a real world airdrop yet, but I'm really keen to. You could essentially, you know, you could airdrop a bunch of tokens to all the citizens of Seattle or give them a way to, to collect those tokens based on their citizenship and say, hey, if the greenhouse emissions goes down by 10% in two months, you're, they're worth this many dollars, right? So I think there's just a, some really cool things, this is a really cool design space you can use. And what's also exciting about them to me, I'm really monologuing, sorry, is... Uh, <laughs> Is that, uh, is that you can do real world stuff with them today. Like I have an open grants program for universities to try to use these where they could create an incentive for their student body or for basically any, anybody. You could create a matriculation incentive for a nearby high school, right? And then experiment with what is it, 
what does it do if we give these to the parents or to the kids or to the teachers? Uh, does that affect change? You know, I think there's real opportunities for real world behavioral economic uh, studies here. Yeah, that's, that's and that excites me too. Yeah, no, that's yep. interesting because you all of a sudden it's like, well, I guess uh, one thing I would ask uh, is if I'm a early crypto community, you know, I just launched a token, I did it maybe on Discord, and I'm very grassroots, and um, you know, there's people on the Discord that feel very engaged because they have the token and like the project. But if I want to in your words, use some more granularity, like set some marketing goals or whatever it may be to help grow the project. Do I have to use the UMA? Does the UMA KPI option pay out in UMA tokens or is there the ability to pay out in my own token? It, it would pay out in your own token. In fact, quite explicitly, you, you could technically lock anything. So you could actually pay out an ETH if you wanted okay. to, but okay. most likely you would want to align their incentives to your project. Right. Yeah. Understood. And so um, the downside of me issuing these tokens is essentially just gas, right? Because they can just expire worthless and my cost is just gas costs and time for writing it. Yeah, I would say that that's true. Okay. And um, so how like how has it gone so far? I mean, you mentioned one example of The Economist, but I'm curious of other, um, you know, you launched in January and just curious of what other examples have been um, created sure. since then. Absolutely. So I'll start with the most positive case that we had, which was um, BadgerDAO used them to help re, uh, to help fix the DIG product, which is a synthetic Bitcoin. And what they did is they incentivized positive rebases of the DIG uh, product, meaning that it would um, that it would close each day above the value of Bitcoin. And immediately upon announcing it, we saw people buy up the DIG token because that would allow them to receive the options, and um, that affected positive rebases. So we saw a pretty immediate uh, impact of the KPI option launch in this case, uh, and it's currently ongoing. Um, but yeah, so that was that was a, a positive example. One, uh, UMA's actual in-house example, we focused on TVL, and we've got some very valuable learnings from it. It's kind of funny, Paul, because like our TVL has only has gone, it went up initially, but it has gone down with the market um, because which is understandable because the things locked in our contracts are the assets that went down, um, including ETH, for example. But what's been uh, just amazing is the community that we've built around it of, of uh, what they're called super humans. And I know that some of them are, are going to be watching this right now because I shared it in our community. Um, I've just never seen anything like it. It's really been mind-blowingly cool, the kind of community participation we've had. And... Um, you know, we talk openly about how can we design the next KPI option, which what um, which will happen after this coming month. We're basically like, yeah, this failed for certain reasons. We didn't really scope, or not failed. It was just like hard to hit that target. It's hard to hit the KPI. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're analyzing why. We're analyzing what the KPI could be for the next one. And so the outcome actually has been really cool. It wasn't even the outcome I was sort of planning on. It was just having this core community of very like strong believers who put in a lot of work and effort and just really cool. Uh, it's yeah. been really cool. Yeah, no, it's um, KPIs had this interesting, I, you know, from my perspective, from my experience using them, they just have this, and I worked at, you know, I it worked at big companies before. And then all of a sudden, I, you know, I'd never been introduced to KPIs. And they had this interesting side effect where if you ascribe a goal that's achievable, that's easily measurable, all of a sudden, you're incentivized to like, and maybe that's just me and how I work. But it just it just it's just interesting, because you feel way more um, bought in, I guess, is the word I, I would use. Um, what like, have there been any, I guess, with the trading aspect of the KPIs, because um, you know, I guess people are buying, it just gets to pay that. So I guess if someone, if there's a KPI, uh, sorry, I'm working through this in my head. There's a KPI for like a marketing goal, like get retweet, you know, our next tweet gets retweeted 5 million times and gets 10 million impressions. Um, if, you know, that, that, you know, maybe the, when it's launched, the KPI is priced at one, but no one thinks it's going to hit. So it's priced at 10 cents. You know, I could, I could buy that KPI. I guess my incentive is to buy that KPI. Right. And in gen, like hopefully mm -hmm. I get a better outcome or I get the sure. outcome where it executes if I think super bullish on it, or I think I could adversely affect it versus anyone else. So I understand that the trading and these are traded on Uniswap liquidity pools or how are these traded? So what we saw happen with the super humans is they actually launched a sushi swap pool and they encouraged each other to fund it. 
and then they kind of went into other uh, we, we had airdropped our uh, KPI option to five different um, communities, governance communities. And so they went around to those discords and they shared about the pool and said, hey, basically they said, hey, if you want to dump your tokens, you can do it here. And they were doing this because they were bullish on the token and they wanted other people to sell them their tokens. And so what's neat about that is we actually saw a, mo a movement of the tokens from people who would be least helpful and least knowledgeable uh, to to the people who are were most bullish and excited, and so it like it, it further aligned their incentives. Um, so that was yeah, that was kind of a neat like sort of market impact. Um, yeah, no, that that is interesting because yeah, the people who are like I don't know what you know I don't even know what Uma does. Why the hell am I getting this yeah. rando token? I'm selling it, but then uh, the super Umans uh, are the ones that are like oh shit, I'm going to buy this because I get yep. ultimately I have to work, but I get um, you know some free tokens. I guess it's an option. Um, I guess with does each KPI need its different a different pool or can it, they all be bundled into one pool? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, essentially, you you answer this question when you write the what we call an UMIP or the UMA improvement proposal, and that's essentially the contract that I spoke of earlier. Mm -hmm. So in that contract, you codify what the outcomes are. Um, so whether it's TVL or number of retweets. You could very well write a payout matrix associated with both of those in one contract. Um, and so like, it, but each one of those is going to be like a, um, a particular ERC20 token that wouldn't be exchangeable with other KPIs. So you would basically decide, do you want this to be a bundled KPI or do you want to run a few different campaigns simultaneously? Um, but once you've minted the token, I mean, that token wouldn't be able to be pooled with another token in the same pool, right? They're going to have their own markets essentially. So it's mm -hmm. just up to you whether you wanted to kind of separate them with multiple KPIs or maybe write something that was a, a matrix. Okay, understood. Um, is that? I guess that's something for future work because it strikes me. I don't know how this is possible, but if you could somehow bundle them, because creating each separate, let's just say at scale, um, this is super popular. You've got mm -hmm. you know ten hundred thousand different organizations using this. Mm -hmm. You know, each organization has subgroups of, like, you know, 50,000 different KPIs, you know, if mm -hmm. each of these, you know, I just, I'm wondering how this works at scale, I guess, like, are you going to have like 250,000 different KPI pools? Um, but maybe that's it's a future question. work. It's a good problem. It's a good problem to have, of course. Sure. But maybe, maybe that's yeah. something that's reserved for future work. So totally get it. No, and it's not, yeah. And you're not putting me in the hot seat with that question. It's because I think it's important, right? But it's also like, you're right. You wouldn't want you know, uh, 250,000 pools or whatever. But like, you also need your KPIs to be sort of suitably understandable. And so you also wouldn't want to give somebody 250 KPIs, you know what I mean? Just personally, right. like they need one no, or two of or course. maybe five KPIs, right? Yeah. Um, and so insofar as you're, you're not going to like drown somebody with uh, organizational outcomes that you want to see, you probably wouldn't just end up doing that, except, you know, different organizations would have their own but they're only going to airdrop those to like relevant parties. Like I couldn't really imagine somebody collecting. I mean, maybe you could imagine like a theme, right? You could imagine someone having a portfolio of KPI options that were associated with Twitter related outcomes. Right. Yeah. Cause they be, were like, yeah. An influencer or something. Or, or, yeah. Yeah, totally. Right. Uh, um, I wonder, yeah. I guess I wonder if there's like a curve opportunity for Yuma Coop KPI options where you could have like KPIs in one pool, you know, like a marketing mm -hmm. KPI pool, but I don't, I don't know. Uh, Interesting idea. Sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what are some, I mean, what have been some, maybe not negative is a good word, but what, what things haven't worked out, would you say that you thought they would, or what, what are some assumptions that you had going in that weren't necessarily proven right? Sure. No, I or think that's a pan, good question. Pan, or, or didn't pan out, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say that one area of struggle that we've had is the, well, a couple things. The bull market makes it hard to compete for attention at the moment. Um, so you come into a team and you're like, Hey, I think that this KPI option design would be really good for your community. And they say, Hey, we totally agree. And maybe we'll think about it later, but we're already not getting eight hours of sleep. You know what I mean? Like, it's just hard right now. You're competing for a lot of attention. And so, um, that's where the super humans have been very instrumental. We've been running these campaigns where people will organize and go into a, another discord all at once in a friendly way. Um, and start conversations. And actually, we built a very strong support end on our end where 
a team will come in and be express an interest and we'll hype write the governance proposal. We'll line up a, a UI UX kind of setup for them, line up a UI rather, um, and really offer that support in house. But that has been like a bit of a learning, right? We can't just put this out there and then um, ask people to just come in and build it because they're busy. Um, I would say another one I already sort of touched on, which is like the TVL KPI was a bit tough because it's not entirely in people's control, right? The crypto market does what the crypto market does. If we had denominated it in ETH instead of in USD, we might have it might have been like a little bit more in people's control because then it would just be how many ETH are locked up, not the dollar value of the ETH and other tokens. Um, so we, we've talked about that for the next rule. Um, so yeah, I would say choosing a KPI that people can achieve. Um, I'm very grateful to say that like the super humans are just like aligned and enjoying it and, and are reassured by the fact that we're like working on a design. Nobody's like just, nobody's rage quit or anything because the TVO right. went down, you know? Right. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so that's been cool. And then yeah. I suppose the other thing, and this is like uh, feedback I would offer to anyone interested in creating one is like, you know, we, 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 we cast a fairly broad net across these five communities. Um, we targeted people who were participating in governance, and we saw a very good response in a, in, a, in a lot of joins in our socials and in an uptick in our activity. But the actual active super humans who are really killing it are like probably under 50 people out of 7,000 target addresses. And so I would, and what we're going to do next time is make it very targeted. Um, like we'll probably have lists of individuals that are going after, including, of course, active super humans. And um, so that was like just definitely another learning was that we didn't get 7,000 people rushing in just because they got them. And um, <clears throat> they weren't necessarily like voting on our behalf in their respective communities either, as we might have hoped, um, which sort of makes sense. Their vested interest is definitely going to be in their home community, not the options we handed them. Um, but that's been a learning. Yep. Yeah. I guess um, with the super humans, do you, would you say that their contribution and I guess fervor to the UMA protocol is increased? Like, is that like, markedly shown a difference in people joining, I guess, super, the super humans. It didn't exist before this, before okay, the KPI so, was, so that was the reason why. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. And so how, like, what are, like, you know, people use KPIs for like, got to hit a marketing goal, got to hit a TVL goal. You know, we, you know, got to create a funnel of a hundred investors we're looking at, um, you know, cold outreach, 50 of them. You know, talk to 10 of them, et cetera, et cetera, stuff like that. But what are some, through the mechanism and your initiative, what are some other interesting areas that maybe people haven't thought about that could be used with, with liquid KPI options, I guess? Sure, sure. I mean, I've sort of thrown out my catalog of ideas as we've talked, you know, around whether it's universities or the SpaceX thing, which is real. Um, I would say that, oh, another idea that I've had is like, you could... You could sort of use KPI options. This is maybe controversial, right? Because um, mm -hmm. we're talking about like campaign finance law. But imagine you could sort of, uh, in a distributed fashion, airdrop KPI options to like all the members of US Congress. And like, because it's a permissionless and open system, like there's not really a way that anyone could stop you doing this. And you could sort of state a particular outcome that you'd like to see occur. Uh, that's interesting to me. I am not suggesting that, that, anyone do it. <laughs> no, that is actually quite interesting um, because you could just give it to them. Yeah, wow, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, right. right? Yeah, you could just give it to them and it's like, hey, um, wow, interesting. If this happens, Pop these are worth money. You know? Right, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, wow, that's interesting. Um, what, um, I guess, so like, how do you see them being developed? Like moving forward, like how do you see them being developed? My, you know, my understanding is that you're trying to, release a platform here of course you're trying to dog food it in its early stages right. and show examples yep. et cetera, et cetera. but what do you mm -hmm. what is your expectation five years ten years down the line how will be this kpi platform look sure absolutely so i would say that that you know kind of going back to the thing i opened with around uma and the broad the broad applications that we have to some degree the kpi options are really just a subset of a particular type of financial contract that you can create so UMA would really like to be moving into being the financial contracts protocol and generalizing out to other kinds of financial contracts um, that exist out in the world. I mean, essentially, you could imagine bringing the financial contract protocol into a world, into governments where there is not sufficient jurisdiction to adjudicate contracts and allowing for a financial system there 
that couldn't exist otherwise. Um, you know, essentially, when you have corrupt governments that don't enforce contracts reliably, business can't happen, right? Like the reason contracts are so valuable is because they allow, and and why they're so important for like countries being successful is because they allow businesses to cooperate when they wouldn't otherwise. And so, like that's that's very high term. Nearer term with the KPI options, I would say they're a little bit more generalizable as well to calling them just like conditional vesting tokens. So you could use them to pay out advisors. You could use them essentially for any initial token distribution because you're assigning conditional outcomes. Um, I mentioned this to you on our pre-call, which is like, it's it's similar to Vitalik's idea of a DICO, which was like a milestone-based ICO where you release you tokens could, um, based on certain for, outcomes. For listeners, if you could describe what a DICO is, um, sure. I think would be helpful. I actually forget exactly what the, it's like D-A, I forget actually what the letters even stand for, but essentially... Yeah. Vitalik came out with this idea back in the ICO craze when we were giving, uh, you know, white papers thirty million dollars, and he was saying like, "Hey, we could do a design where you lock up a certain amount of money, and it's unlocked at each milestone that occurs, and um, that would allow us to like, and then if that doesn't occur, the money's returned to you, right, in the form of ETH. Um, and so you can you can create a similar system where you're either distributing tokens to token holders or you're locking up funds that the team can access like a team could create this for themselves and sort of trustlessly ensure that um that investors like are going to see certain outcomes um rather than just having to trust the people directly so i mean that's 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 kind of an awesome i hadn't even thought of it in that direction actually until we were just talking but essentially it would give the investors more trust, right? It's like, you're not actually going to get this money and it'd be returned to me if you don't hit a milestone by a certain date. Right. And well, that's I guess, essentially what the DICO was. I guess my, I guess my somewhat of a pushback there would be, you know, at, at then the founders would be like, well, you don't trust me, you know, like, uh, you know, to execute. I don't know. It just, uh, that is interesting it, because you could use it for like a token sale, for example. Um, although I guess you distribute the KPI options to people who have traded on Uniswap or contributed liquidity to a curve pool. And then, so in this case, what you would do is you would like, I think you're right, but a founder would want to volunteer this from their side, not necessarily be oh, fair. It from the investor side. Fair. And then, yeah, then it's different. They wouldn't, yeah. Right. And they wouldn't probably airdrop them. They would just sell them to investors. So they'd say, Hey, lock up. Uh, you know, 100 ETH in this pool, and we're going to give, we receive a token. If that token, sorry, if we hit X milestone, let's say V1 gets on mainnet in 12 months, that token will be unlocked for a certain amount of collateral. If not, as the sponsor of that token, the investor would be the sponsor in this case, meaning the person who put the collateral in and minted it, they would be able to withdraw their collateral back out because if they didn't get, you know, V1 on mainnet after 12 months or whatever the, the KPI or the condition was set. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I mean, that's already, you know, that is already, you know, in a lot of SAFT documents, you know, already. Mm -hmm. It's yep, like, they totally. need, you, you need to have token, you need to have network launch, which is typically defined as like token generation and event within one year who, or something. Who enforces and adjudicates a SAFT? Uh, that's a really good question. I, I haven't, uh, I haven't been part of that process where it's gone down that wrap that, that route of having to like enforce it. I would imagine wherever the jurisdiction is being signed. So typically it's like a Cayman islands or something, but sure. I actually don't know how that process works, but exactly. So, and like, yeah. I think we sign, we typically sign those in good faith, but I think there's also a yeah. certain amount of, um, you know, don't bother. It's not worth it, right? Do you want oh. to go fight a legal battle for three months in the Cayman Islands? Like hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of it is like, you know, you get rights. You know, investors get rights in these things, but you know, how are they enforced? And if a new investor comes in in the next round and is like, "You're not getting this right," it's like, well, okay, you know, I'm not going to hold up this round just because. Yep. So, yeah, no, that that is interesting. I guess um, has what what's like stopping you know because there's new you know, people are looking at balancer pools or Gnosis safe for launching. Has anyone explored this use case for a token sale or you're waiting on it? Excuse me. Um, I would say that we're in some talks with people. There's, there's someone who's working on trying to build some of the basic infrastructure for conditional vesting tokens. Um, I would say that we're just sort of generally working on it. Um, this, yeah. this has represented a little bit of a shift strategically um, because as you came to this call, like you, you know, of, and we 
we market ourselves as synthetic assets, but we're sort of starting to narrow down a little bit in certain types. So I would say that we're sort of early in this, um, this direction. Um, and so for example, we have uh, grants and we're doing a hackathon upcoming. And so like, we're essentially, you know, trying to get people to build, build this out uh, with us. Um, mm -hmm. So that's so, kind of the stage we're in right now. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the grant program and the hackathon? Sure. So, you know, the, the, the hackathon that we're going to participate in is the hack money one with uh, East global, which is one that we did last year. We had some really great projects come out of it. One of them got funding. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then the, the grant program is actually um, something that is just going to kind of work alongside that. And so one idea that we're considering right now with the hackathon, for example, is not only can you win a, a prize if you build out a certain implementation of, of KPI options or using our optimistic Oracle, but we can also give those teams KPI options that would pay out if in three months they get on mainnet or sort of whatever criteria we were to define for them. Um, so that's one initiative that we're working on. Generally, like we have an ongoing open request for proposal when it comes to basically anything. So like all the ideas that I've discussed here, most of them are sort of yet to be built. And so if anyone watching, uh, you know, has some idea or is inspired by this and can like pull together a team to help build it, like we'd be more than enthusiastic to hear that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it, with the hack, with the hack money, um, hackathon and the grant program, are those centered around specifically KPIs or is it more broadly contributing to the UMA? UMA and it's, um, well, that's a great question. I would say that it is specifically relating to uh, a suite of products that include um, the bonds that I mentioned, that include the KPI options. Um, we also have call options. Uh oh, your camera sorry, just went dark. Yeah, on me. My, my, my camera just went dark. Sorry. All right. Yeah. Um, there we go. Um, yeah. So that, that there's kind of a suite of products. There's the optimistic Oracle is also pretty flexible. You can just ask it a question and I'm totally keen to see anyone build on that as well. So you could imagine a prediction market having a series of escalation games where if it gets to us, then you ask Uma to sort of, uh, to rule on an outcome. So we'd love to see that kind of implementation too, which is like, much lighter weight. It's just like plugging into this one use case for the for the truth machine. That's how right. I phrase it anyway. Just saying. Um, yep. And, and for the grant program, I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on with my camera, but for the grant program, I'll switch it. But for the grant program, what do you, um, how much money are you giving out? Like what's the range of, of cap or of grants that you're giving out? Um, I can't really say specifically in part because we're like in the middle of sort of designing it and I'm not just being opaque. I just don't mm -hmm. like have a straight answer for you. I would tell you that we are willing to give out tens to hundreds of millions of dollars for the right ideas and the right outcomes. So what's, and the reason I can say that with confidence is because of the KPI options program, because we can say, Hey, you know, we're going to give people a grant, but it's going to have some amount of conditional payout associated with it. And if you were to achieve, you know, X, Y, or Z goals, then you could be looking at some huge payout, assuming we can choose a KPI that's, um, as I mentioned earlier, like uh, an adequate proxy of, uh, of actual adoption for the UMA protocol. Um, so the sky's the limit is the short answer. Yeah, okay. And I guess where can, well, I guess going back to KPI options, one thing that just occurred to me, have you guys thought about how these things are taxed? Like how... It's got to be a taxable event, no? I don't know. <laughs> uh, we, <laughs> we, I mean, like the protocol is a Cayman entity. Um, that's a good question. Uh, and I, but I would probably be making errors to even fumble around an answer for you. Um, uh, I'll just give you the very boilerplate answer, of course, which is like every individual receiving taxes <laughs> or receiving income is like responsible for reporting. Yeah, yeah reporting very jurisdiction. Fair, fair <laughs> enough. No, but it's, um, yeah. it's interesting because it is utility that you're providing, um, which is interesting. Um, I mean, you know, we have anonymous uh, people working, you know, they're receiving yeah, these yeah. things, you're just receiving them on the ETH blockchain. No, no, I, I wonder um, if it's not, not taxable to you guys, but taxable to the recipient, or rather, oh, should, course, these, sure, sure, should, sure. should these people be reporting KPI options, just like, I guess it would be, my gut says it would be similar to a regular option, but anyway. Um, what about, have you guys thought about like, so right now, 
right now it's just crypto native companies or crypto native individuals that have a MetaMask or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Have you thought well, about how? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Didn't mean to. No, please, please, please. No, I was interrupting I, you. I was, um, you know, have you thought about how this could be used outside of just crypto native or that UI UX, you know, hurdle that people have to get over um, to get access to these types of things? Sure. It's not something that we spent too much time thinking on, I think, because we want to focus on like the easiest product market fit that we can get to. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's kind of interesting. The example I gave about The Economist magazine, for example, like if we were to make a donation to The Economist Foundation, like we would probably need some sort of broker to help with that because that they would need to sort of cash it out for that on their behalf and give them the money. Um, What's cool about this, though, um, and something I particularly am excited about is basically the opportunity to use this as an incentive to onboard people into crypto. Hmm. So imagine if you used something like um, Stripe and you use their database to identify, like, uh, the example I give is, like, um, people with an IRA worth over 100K on Vanguard. I don't actually know if Stripe has this data. You could airdrop, and as long as you can verify that the person replying quali qualifies with those criteria, so it's like civil resistant, you could announce an airdrop and just say, hey, for the next month, we're going to give anyone who can prove these criteria you know, X number of dollars of tokens to an ETH address, and here's how you set up an ETH address, and here's how you could redeem it. So you can actually use this uh, as, a, as an onboarding mechanism. To answer your question directly, like, have we worked on how to make it like much more crypto to cash kind of setup. It's not something we've thought a lot about. It's definitely something someone building a program could do. Yeah. Um, but well, I, I, I'm excited to think of it as onboarding. How do you, how do you airdrop something, anything, KPI options or anything to a user that doesn't even have an ETH wallet? Like, how do you make sure that that amount that you're airdropping them gets to them? Mm -hmm. Right. Sure. Cause you'd have to send it to a wallet address and then, You'd have to make sure that so, they are the ones with the private keys, that wallet address. So I, sure. I don't, to someone who has no idea about crypto, I don't know how you, I'm curious how you do that. Yeah, I mean, you would be making them learn about crypto, but I'll answer your question. Um, functionally, what you would do is like you would, so what we did is we locked up 2 million UMA and we minted 1 million uh, KPI option tokens. So we just had those like in our wallet. And then we used a Merkle distribution, just like uh, Uniswap did, to set up a claims portal where people who were qualifying addresses could come claim them. However, I've kept a certain amount of those like on the side, which I can use to pay out to community members at different times. So it doesn't have to be a single airdrop event. You, you can just give them out over time, and they're going to be exchangeable and worth the same amount as any other until the end, right? And so to answer your question, what you would do in this scenario is you would have to come up with a criteria where the people could prove to you their identity, essentially, or prove to you some way. And so if you had a list of accounts, um, let's say you just did Twitter, you could do a Twitter uh, names, right? You could say, hey, send me, send us a DM with your address from the t qualifying Twitter account, right? That would be your verification method. Um, some people wouldn't participate because they don't understand crypto. But some people who've never used crypto before would participate because you've just given them a financial incentive. You've essentially said, hey, here's some free crypto as long as you take the effort to, to get it. Um, yeah, does that quite answer no, your no, question? No, no, no. That, that, so you would just lock up tokens for the airdrop and then you'd give it to them once people are onboarded and proven that they've got 10,000 followers on Twitter and you figured out a way to verify that. Then they have a wallet address and they're like, all right, cool, we'll airdrop you some tokens. Yep, exactly. Yep, okay. that's how yeah, you yeah. Would tie cool. those. Yeah, yeah. Together. No, that make, I was thinking that makes much more sense in my head. I was like, you're sending tokens in one airdrop, as you mentioned before, to a wallet yeah, address yeah, yeah. that you're just giving people, and they somehow have to get the private key to that. Public. Anyway, much more yeah, complicated than I, gotcha, I, I thought you. of. Yeah, I, um, I follow. What? Um, so, what are some examples? Like, so what are some, what are some tooling or some some applications that you know people can build on top of? You know, you mentioned the RFP. What are some ideas that are in there? Mm -hmm. um, I'll sort of give you an answer. I'm actually kind of curious to even bounce this back to you. Like, I know that um, that you've talked about the different way that you guys do funding, and I know that you come in pretty early on projects. Yep. Um, I'm actually kind of curious, if you don't mind me bouncing this question to you, Please is do. like, yeah. 
what sort of ideas come to your mind when you when especially when you encounter um, early stage projects like what kinds of problems do you think a product like this might be able to solve well i think um, it's i think it's, it's what, cool what are because, the problem points for them yeah well yeah. i mean i think i think where it's cool is you know the model of of our fund um is that we you know we take a very hands-on approach to investing in our startup so we're meeting with them on a weekly basis and we're going over kpis and it'd be cool <laughs> Um, you know, we, we take it very seriously and we view it as a two way street, but it'd be, it, I think it'd be kind of interesting if you could apply this to all investors and even just advisors, right? Because a lot of companies bring on advisors, but, and they mm -hmm. give them 50 bips or, uh, a point, I guess, of equity. Most of the time, mm -hmm. the advisors don't really do much. So it would be cool if you could make it, it allows what the product allows is it allows for founders to make it a two way street instead of sometimes it's a one way street. So I think yep. that's where it could get super interesting because it's like, okay, yeah, you said you would connect us to X Y Z investor, or you know, you said you would you know do X Y Z, and so it instead of um, you know it just allows uh, founders, it makes it more equitable in terms of who's holding who accountable, I guess I would say. Um, yep. So I think I think it's interesting there, and particularly when you're bringing on again ad advisors or part time people or things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Or contractors even so i think that's really interesting um so you know typically when they're setting okay i'm sorry i'm working through this in my head as you asked me but uh you know typically when they're setting kpis you know we have one on maybe maybe they have one on marketing maybe they have one on product maybe they have mm -hmm. one on finance and then there's sub there's sub ones in there um so i mean i i'm hesitant to say like we would pay out capital if they complete certain okrs because i do think it's immensely valuable for us to, you know, we want to be able to trust these people and not like handhold sure. them or handcuff them. So I'm hesitant to say there should be KPIs on that um, because mm -hmm. I, I really do believe, you know, we got to, we got to do our homework and trust these people to execute. Um, yep. But yeah, I guess, I guess that's what I would say as a, right off the bat, I've seen so many, mm -hmm. you know, not to be uh, offensive to anybody, but so many useless advisors that don't do much. Uh, and they sure. have 1% of the company or whatever. So I guess, yep. yeah. I think that's a great, a great example. And it's one that we've explored um, ourselves. In fact, we're like in discussions right now um, on that very thing. Um, another thing that we've launched was referral options. Um, this isn't quite a KPI. I guess it sort of is. It's a targeted one. So essentially, anyone could refer talent to UMA. And you fill out a little form and you never reveal, need to reveal who you are. You just put in an ETH address and you say, hey, I think you should check out, um, you know, Paul. He's, he'd be a good guy for you. So we receive that. We check, out, we check him out and we hire him. If he's still with UMA in 12 months, you get essentially at the time of posting was equivalent with $30,000. Um, there's also some milestones along the way where you get payouts, like if, it, if they um, complete the first interview and then if they get hired. Um, and then if they stay for 12 months. And so essentially we've created a, a decentralized referral system where you don't need to be a professional um, high clout um, introducer. You can just be yeah. anyone, right? No, that's interesting. Um, yeah. No, that's yeah. really interesting. It's like you're, you're, you're almost democratizing headhunting in a way, you know? Yeah, which is not something, like I haven't had a lot of experience with the headhunters, but the person who does our hiring had a lot yeah. of things to say about them and was excited about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you know, headhunters get a get a get a portion of the salary. I don't know if it's the employee or the employer who pays. I think maybe right. it depends. But here you're you're allowing that same you're giving that contract to anybody really. And you're allowing yep. more, you know, I think what's what's great about it is even in the case of advisors, like you're allowing more granularity because like I could do a startup today, bring on you as an advisor and you know, I could give you a one year cliff or I could cliff it however I want gives me some degree of protection but it would be cool if i could of course have the one-year cliff and or cliff it however i want but also have that granularity because you were like oh you're you know great at marketing and you said you could increase my twitter followers by x and you know my yep. you know write some medium art you know you said you'd write six medium articles for me and you'd intro me to 10 investors and it'd be cool with like underneath that cliff you get have all these other things that filter up to that cliff um yep so I think that's cool. I think that's what's really cool about it, personally, for me. So totally, yeah. Um, um I guess with yeah, the last question I, I would have is, I guess, how can we be helpful? I know you mentioned, um, you know, the grant program, the hack money. Where where can people find this information? I guess is what I would ask. Sure. So, um, Twitter is probably our biggest like announcement channel. So that's just at Uma Protocol. 
Um, I would suggest anyone who's interested in like asking questions, like if, if anyone's heard this and, and is interested in it or wants to see like, hey, could this work, um, to hop into our Discord, which is discord.umaproject.org, not .uma protocol. I realize that's a little confusing. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, hop in our Discord. The the ask I might make around this is just to kind of come up with some cool ideas. Um, if you if you know uh, if there's a team that you think could use this kind of application, like we're really interested in helping people kind of build it out, and and the super umans are particularly keyed in to do that. So if you showed up in our Discord and and said, hey, uh, you could tag me at Clayton. Um, you know, I'm interested in building this conditional vesting setup, or I want to use KPI options to kickstart our community. Um, we can kind of do a lot of the footwork and understanding, like whether it's a good application or not. Um, the super humans are like well incentivized to help you because that's exactly you know our KPI, our upcoming KPI is looking like it's going to be focused on probably the number of integrations that we get. If I can get the team buy in on that, and so you're going to have people that are you know excited to get one more integration, which I think is cool because it demonstrates the exact kind of effectiveness you'd be looking for. So that's my main ask would be if, if, uh, if you know someone or a team or you are interested in using this just to come hang out with us and chat. Uh, it's fun. You know, it's just like, it's pretty fun to be in this economics design space. You know, it's, yeah, it's no, cool it's, stuff that we get to do. Yeah, no, it's, it's really cool. It's, um, it's, uh, you know, once you start thinking about things like you could, you know, just what you mentioned, um, you could turn that into a KPI, right? So, yeah. uh, you know, it's, so it's, it's just cool, like the thread you can pull. So anyway, it, it was totally. a pleasure chatting and, and pulling that thread Same. with you. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks, Paul. It was really a pleasure. And thanks to everyone who took the time to listen and understand all this. It's uh, good stuff.